<laughs> it looks like everybody's in here, so I'll just do a quick introduction there before we get Simon talking about uh, Wardly Mapping. Uh, welcome to an introduction on Wardly Mapping. I'm ex particularly excited about this because I don't know anything about it, so this is going to be fantastic for me and my learning. Uh, just a really quick thing, we just want to make sure before we get started, I want to begin by highlighting the Ford 50s Code of Conduct. Uh, again, as you know, as we move uh, all of our interactions online, it's essential to remember that the Code of Conduct applies everywhere. It can be tempting to hide behind um, the anonymity of virtual platforms, and we just expect our community to behave in the same manner. So be nice to everybody, and we'll have a good time. So You'll find the Ford 50 code of conduct by visiting the Ford 50 platforms on the navigation menu. But first, let me introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. My name is Robert Butler. I'm an outreach officer and event manager and multimedia specialist for the Federal Government of Canada in the Deputy Minister's Office of Public Service Accessibility. I'm a silo smasher and I'm searching for ways to build better working environments for persons with disabilities in an ever expanding world. But that's enough about me because you're not here to hear from me. You're here to hear from Simon Wardley. So dang, Simon, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this this pronunciation up. But Dang Xiaoping, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Dang Xiaoping. Xiaoping, perfect. Once described managing the economy as crossing the river, uh, the river by feeling the stones. In other words, have a direction but be adaptive. But in a world of constant change, how do you determine the right thing to do? Which pebble to tread on? How do you understand where you're going and where you need to go? How do you know if your strategy is right? Is there even such a thing? So in this talk, we're going to examine the issue of situational awareness and examine how it applies to technology. Using examples from the government and the commercial world, we will explore how you can map a complex environment, identify opportunities to exploit, what techniques to use, and learn to play the game. So let's give a Ford 50 welcome to Simon Wardley. Simon. Hey Rob, we, we seem to have some music playing. Yeah, I had to put that in a little bit back. I need a little, little emotion here. <laughs> no problem at all. Okay, so look, I've got a presentation, uh, which I can take everybody through, uh, and it'll go through the basics of mapping, how to introduce it, some, some lessons along the way. Um, at any point, we can stop. So if people have got questions, we probably won't get to the end anyway. Uh, and I've got a whiteboard as well, so I can get onto some mapping and that sort of stuff. Um, before I get going, I suppose a uh, quick question to the audience. You should have a reactions button at the bottom uh, where you can give a wave a, or give a thumbs up. Can you give a thumbs up if you've done any mapping before? Just give me an idea. I'll give you a few minutes. No, I won't give you a few minutes, a few seconds. Any thumbs up? Did you, Rob, could you hear me? I can hear you. I see a bunch of thumbs up. I see about one, two, three, four, five thumbs up. Okay, so very for the majority of the 126 people, this is all relatively new. Okay, not a problem at all. So let's get cracking. I'm going to share a screen. Do, do, do. There we go. And it should say mapping on it. So this is what we're going to go through. I'm going to cover the issue of strategy, and then we'll talk about situational awareness, after this, we'll talk about maps themselves. Uh, then we'll talk about being trapped by context, uh, get onto patterns, after which uh, we'll talk about doctrine and uh, just do it, uh, how to go about implementing mapping and the issue of digital sovereignty if we get there, because uh, that's always quite a fun topic, which mixes all sorts of things together, uh, including maps and culture and, uh, and, and competing against other nations. Um, I'm not going to go through organizational structure, pioneer settler town planner models and all those sorts of things or any of the uh, deep gameplay because uh, literally we've, we've got a short amount of time. Okay, so I'll talk about strategy uh, first of all. Um, so this starts um, for me back in 2003, 2004 roughly. Uh, I was working at this company called Fatango. Uh, it was an online photo service uh, with about 16 different lines of business, very successful. Uh, revenue was growing, profitability was growing, all very good. Um, across those services only had 10 million users. It's a really small scale by today, but back then uh, it was relatively reasonable. Uh, but it had a problem, big problem. And the problem uh, was the CEO. Uh, the CEO didn't have a clue 
uh, what they were doing. They were just making it up as they went along. They were a fake CEO. And I know this because I was the CEO. So, um, you know, I, I used to come up with all this sort of stuff of visions and blast statements, strategy, all that sort of stuff, but I hadn't got a clue. Um, I did come up with uh, various vision statements, like this is 2003. Uh, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, I'd heavily adopted extreme programming. Um, um, written by uh, well, Ken Beck, who, who I know, um, we'd adopted it earlier. I adopted it throughout the organization. Uh, we were heavy users and providers of open source. Um, but the problem with this is literally I pinched it from another company and, and changed a few words. So I was a little bit worried that people would rumble uh, that I didn't know what I was doing. So I started going around recording other CEOs talking about strategy. I would uh, listen to for what I call uh, business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or BLAS for short. And these are the common BLAS. I do this every couple of years. Uh, I think this one was 2014. So common BLAS are digital business, big data, uh, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, open source. If you did it today, it'd probably be the same, plus AI, blockchain. Well, you've got to have a bit of AI, you've got to have a bit of blockchain, et cetera. Um, so then I grabbed a whole bunch of companies' documents and created something called the Blah template. Our strategy is Blah. We will lead a Blah effort of the market through our use of Blah and Blah to build a Blah. And then I simply smashed them together, uh, the Blahs and the Blah templates, and also generated at random 64 different strategies. Things like this. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of customer focused competitive advantage and disruptive social media to build a collaborative revolution. I mean, it's total, total gibberish. Um, but I, I sent it around uh, I, last time uh, I did this. I got about 400 responses uh, back um, of three basic types. Um, the first type being this is the exact wording from our business plan. The second being I've seen two of these used already. And the third, my favorite is are you for hire? So just to finish this off, a friend of mine has put this all online. Uh, this is strategy as a service, by the way. If you ever need a strategy, it's really simple. Just type in the URL at the bottom. It will automatically create you one based upon nothing whatsoever. Uh, if, if, you, 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 if you want, you can pretend there's AI and blockchain or whatever else behind it if it makes you feel comfortable. Um, so our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort of the market through our use of big data and social media to build a digital business. If you don't like it, it's really simple. Just press refresh and keep on going until you find one you like. So I started to suspect long ago um, that I might not be the only person who was making it all up. So I started to read everything I could find on strategy and got absolutely uh, nowhere. And then um, I was in a bookshop and the bookseller, um, she was a very, very, very good bookseller. She persuaded, she said, have you read Sun Tzu, The Art of War? And I said, no. And so she persuaded me to buy two copies because they're all translations. And uh, so they're all different. And I'm very grateful for that because it was in the reading, the second translation, uh, that I, I, I noticed something unusual. So um, basically Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One, uh, leadership, oh, sorry, one purpose, your moral imperative. Uh, two, understand your landscape, the environment you're working in. Three, understand climatic patterns, so the landscape and how it's changing. Four, understand doctrine, so your principles of organization. And five, uh, leadership. Uh, so that, that's the bit where you work out where you're going to attack and how you're going to play the game. By the way, I'm at home. We're all at home. So if my young boy comes in and starts playing the trumpet, you know, uh, that's the way it is. It's his home too as well. So you've got purpose, landscape, climatic patterns, doctrine, leadership. I was quite excited by this. And then I came across John Boyd. So John Boyd created something called the OODA loop. Uh, there's, uh, you start off with the first well, you have your game, the purpose, what you're trying to do. You start off with the first O, which I observe. That's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. Then you orientate yourself around the space. That's what principles doctrine is about. Then you decide where you're going to act and then you, you act. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback uh, on, my, uh, on the line. I, I, are you all on mute, by the way? 
Uh, I can see if you can put yourself on mute. Please. Uh, there's a little bit of noise, that's all. Okay, super duper. Right, anyway, so Uda, uh, loop, you observe the environment, landscape, climatic patterns, orientate yourself around it, decide where you're going to act on an act. And I was like, wow, this sort of starts to make sense. And in the heart of this, uh, there are two whys. And the why of purpose, uh, your moral imperative, and the why of movement, uh, as in, why do I make this move over that move? So let me explain those. The why of purpose, like in a game of chess, it might be to win the game. And the why of movement is, um, you know, do I move this piece or, or that piece? Now, I'm going to ask uh, Rob, Claudia, do we have the ability to mute everyone? I don't like to do that, but I'm getting a lot of keyboard tapping, that's all, or, or some sort of noise in the background. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, get that fixed for you. I'm working Wonderful. on that right now. Okay, super duper. Thank you. Um, so what you've got is uh, two whys, the why of purpose, as in your moral imperative, and the why of movement. Do I make this move over that move? And this was my strategy cycle, and it sort of made sense to me. But at the very heart of this was this question of landscape. How do I observe and understand the landscape? Because it's a cycle. And the more I go around this, the better I get at the game, assuming I can observe the landscape. It's like playing a game of chess. You get better the more you play, assuming you can see the board. So this brought me onto the subject of situational awareness. Okay, hang on a second. Do, 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 do. So situational awareness is best explained uh, why I use two examples. Um, the first one is Vikings. Now, I don't actually have any pictures of real Vikings. So this is my frightening Viking. And Vikings used to navigate through the aid of stories. So from Herman, head due west towards half, you will have sailed north of Hatland. So they used to learn epic stories. And you spend years learning those. And that's how you used to navigate a boat. Uh, this is before we got sunspots, uh, 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 sunstone, sorry, and navigation charts. All right, now that epic story, and it's a huge story actually, roughly translates into this. And so I simply asked myself the question, what would I use to navigate? A visual map or, or a verbal story? And of course, the, the answer for me is if I'm giving somebody directions uh, down the street, I might give them a, um, a verbal story. But otherwise, anything complex, I'm going to use a visual map. And then I started looking more into this question of mapping and I started looking into mil military history. And so I get to Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. Uh, the Persians were invading. Now there are about 140 to 170,000 Persians, we're not quite sure how many, but what um, Themistocles did was decide to block off the Straits of Artemisium, it's a, a narrow pass, um, a, a waterway where the forcing the Persians along a coastal road into a very narrow pass known as Thermopylae, where a small number of troops, because the Greeks only had about 4,000 in their standing army and the rest of the army being elsewhere, uh, could defend against a larger force. Now in, in that 4,000 troops, there are about 300 Spartans. And this is where we get the story of the 300 frog. So um, I thought, great, well, how would I do this in business? And, and one of the things that I uh, intend to use in business is, is something called a SWOT diagram. So I thought, well, let's see, see what happens if I use a SWOT. So I went strength, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Uh, opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans or Athenian. Uh, we actually hate the, um, the, the Spartans. And the threats, the uh, Persians get rid of us. And the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. And so I was looking at that SWAT and thought, well, hang on a minute. What would I use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Would I use position and movement described on a map? Or would I use some sort of magic framework like a SWAT? Well, the SWAT is completely hopeless. And, but I kept on looking around in my organization and I had lots of SWATs. I also had lots of stories. So I started to think about this problem and I realized that most of my navigation in my business was storytelling. Most of my learning was secrets of success. So we'd listen to other people, uh, you, know, you know, top 10 secrets of success, blah, and we, you know, we'd, we'd copy that. 
And, and most of my strategy was actually magic frameworks like SWOT. And what I wanted to be was more in this high situational awareness environment. Um, navigation would have to be visual, learning would have to be context specific, strategy would have to be position and movement. And I assume this is what you learned at business school because I never went to business school, I just built companies. Um, and my stuff is now taught at several business schools. But anyway, um, I assume that's what you learned. And uh, obviously to go from one to another, I need some way of mapping uh, the landscape. And I started to think to myself, well, hang on, if I don't do this, you know, the question, why did the general bombard the hill? Um, you know, why does anybody do something? This is secrets of success. Well, it's never a case of uh, General Bombard's a hill because 67% of other successful generals bombard hills. And there's always more sense to it than that. There's always position and movement on a map. But a lot of the stuff I was doing was simply copying others. So 67% of companies are doing AI, better get some AI, blockchain, better get some blockchain, whatever it happened to be. So I had to somehow break this. So this brought me into maps. So I had lots of maps, business process maps, uh, systems maps, uh, mind maps, um, uh, you know, today customer journey maps, all sorts of maps. And I took one of them, one of my systems maps, and I looked at it and said, right, we've got a number of components on here, all connected by roads or whatever we want to call them. Uh, I'll go CRM, customer relationship management, and I'll move it across. And I thought to myself, how, how has the map changed? Let me do that again. It was over there and I moved it here. How has the map changed? And I realized it hasn't changed. But I thought if I took a geographic map and I took, I don't know, Australia and moved it next to England, does that change the map? Yeah, of course it does. But it doesn't here. Well, why not? Well, the reason why not, it's because it's not a map. It's a graph. Now, to understand the distinction, um, the three diagrams at the top are identical. They're all graphs. Uh, there are three places in the UK, Nottingham, London, Dover, connected by two roads. Anyway, the three diagrams at the top are identical. The three maps at the bottom are totally different. And they're different because they've got a compass. And more importantly, in a map, space has meaning. So if you move a component in a map, it changes the context and the meaning of the map because, you know, you're observing a landscape. And what I came to realize is in business, unfortunately, when it came to maps, we keep using that word, and I'm afraid it doesn't mean what we think it means. Almost everything we call a map in business is not a map, it's a graph. In order to be a map, you've got to have the basic characteristics of a map. The first thing you need in order to give space meaning is an anchor. So in geographical, that's like magnetic north. Then you need position of pieces relative to the anchor. So this is north, south, east, or west of that. So Nottingham is, is, is north of London, and it's also west. But you also need consistency of movement. Um, so for example, if I go um, uh, southwest from London, I, I get to Dover. Well, actually you don't, because it's really more southeast, but that's, you know, all maps are imperfect. We make better maps. But the, but the key thing here, is that north is north and south is south and east is east. So there's consistency of movement. So it's the same with geographic maps, anchor position and movement. It's gotta be the same with a map of a competitive landscape. So I thought, right, well, how do I do this? Um, so I started off by thinking about um, what was my anchor going to be? And I started off with a tea shop. I thought I'd start something simple. I thought we, we could have multiple anchors. We could have uh, uh, multiple users, consumers of tea. So we've got the public, hopefully we'll drink tea. Uh, we've got the business selling tea. We may have government regulating tea, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do, if I'm going to, to map out a space, I've gotta have an anchor, which means I'm going to need to know my users. The next thing I'm gonna to have to think about what they, they need. Now, in the case of a tea shop, I can narrow this down to a cup of tea. So public wants to drink cups of tea, hopefully, and business wants to sell cups of tea, right? We've got that nice link there. Now, a cup of tea on its own. Oh, and somebody's asked me, does Simon read the chat? And the answer is yes, I do, but uh, I, I have to uh, read and speak at the same time. I'm not so good at multitasking, but I will get there. Anyway, so, um, 
you've got a cup of tea. A cup of tea itself needs other things. It needs tea, it needs cup, it needs hot water, it needs kettle, it needs power. Now what I can do is create a chain of needs. Um, and this gives me a concept or an idea of position based upon a concept known as visibility. So to so the public, the cup of tea is something very visible to them. The power that heats the kettle to make the hot water to make the cup of tea is actually far less visible to them. So what you're, you're doing is you're doing what's known as a partial ordered list based upon visibility. And I put this axis on the left hand side and says value chain visible at the top, invisible at the bottom. OK, so now I've got anchor and position, but I'm still missing movement and that's critical. Well, it turns out that pretty much all forms of capital evolve and there's a common pattern by which they evolve. And you start with the genesis of the novel and new custom built examples, products and rental services, commodity and utility services. So what I can do is simply put the pieces where they should be. And now I've got anchor position and movement. And this also teaches me another lesson, which is, you know, I need to understand what is being considered. It's not enough just to know the chain that this is linked to this and is linked to this. We really need to understand the context. So how we're treating things. The kettle is custom built or power is a commodity or whatever it happens to be. Now, because of this, I've now got a common language I can talk with others about. So somebody can come along to me and say, you're missing a need like staff. And somebody else can say, oh, staff, they should be more commodity with robots. Or somebody can come along and add financial figures because these are stocks of capital and flows of capital. So from this, we can be build P&Ls. We could also challenge assumptions. So somebody might come along to me and say, why are you using custom built kettles? Surely we should be using standard kettles. I can do that now because I understand the context not just the details. And somebody might say to me, ah, oh, well, brand exclusivity. Okay, marketing, there's a special reason why we need custom built kettles. So it doesn't matter whether it's finance or you know, operations or development or whether it's marketing, we, because it's a common language, we can all talk about the space. And before anybody says why anybody would build a custom kettle, if you've ever worked in IT, we love building custom kettles. Uh, and so, you know, always go, I always would argue, you know, if the user needs a slice of toast, what should you do? Well, you know, if you're gonna do it lots of times, buy a cheap toaster. There's a wonderful project recommend uh, looking to called the Toaster Project. Um, it's Thomas Thwaite, um, Royal College of Arts. He spent nine months trying to build a toaster from scratch, raw components. Uh, and that's what it looked like, um, cost about $1,000, uh, burst into flames first time it was used. Uh, the reason why we can have really amazing toasters for 40, 40 odd dollars is because all the components are highly industrialized. But we'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so let's go back to Fatango then. So I took my systems graph and I went, okay, well, the first thing I need to focus on the user and their needs. And, uh, you know, I can put the business in here. I could put government and others. So I'm just going to have the customer. And mainly what they were after was online photo storage, printer, online image manipulation. Okay. Next thing I needed to think about the components. Well, I needed website, CRM, runtime, compute, data center power. So I've got my chain. And then I need to understand what's being considered because, you know, there's a world of difference between a custom built runtime and a commodity uh, a runtime or a custom built compute and a commodity compute. So I need to put things where they are. And that was the first map uh, that I produced in 2005. Now, you'll, if you look at my maps, you'll notice I rarely ever put the value chain there because that's only there. Uh, scaffolding for people when they're beginning to map just gives you a pointer it's not actually real at all and the reason why it's it's not real it's, it's fairly simple um, from a customer point of view uh, they're interested in the website which requires a runtime requires compute requires power power is quite removed it's far away it's not very visible for them unless you create them a new need like environmental concern. And that way then suddenly power is much more visible to them. So visibility is actually within the chain itself. And that's why there's not really an axis on the left-hand side. It should actually look like that. Okay, so that's the basics of a map. The question now should be something along the lines of, so what? Who cares? I've just learned how to do a basic map. What was the point of that? Okay, 
Well, that brings me on to the issue of being trapped by context. So one of the problems I find in organizations is storytelling. Uh, in fact, we, we run around telling everybody uh, that good leaders are great storytellers. You know, I mean, wonderful articles written in various uh, um, uh, management uh, um, uh, journals about the importance of storytelling. The problem is um, stories are inherently political because you have a storyteller. So we, we tell people that, you know, your idea didn't succeed because you sold it in the wrong way. If you were a better storyteller, blah, 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 it would have succeeded. Well, that also means that when you challenge somebody's story, you're now challenging that person themselves. So it's always going to become highly political. And it's the same, if you think about maps, uh, this is a map of an old Roman city uh, of which there's, oh, 35 odd points of interest. Uh, residential areas, military areas, uh, things like this. Um, if you were going to describe this in a story and every single path from A to B, not doing complicated paths like A, B and C, but just simply A to B, um, is 870 paths. So it would take you about 20,000 words in 25 word chunks to describe that. Um, and I could give you a path in there uh, how to go from, I don't know, this place, place of interest to that place of interest. And I, I give you the story. And if you tell me, I, I think your story is wrong, you are challenging me, me as a person. One of the beauties about putting it on a map, um, because, you know, if you challenge me, I'm going to get angry. Um, but if you put it on a map and I go A to B, we can look at the map and go, well, actually, there might be a different way of doing this. Uh, we might go that path. Now, what, what we're carefully doing is not saying the person is wrong. We're saying our view of the map is wrong. There's a different way of doing this. So let me give you an example of this in practice. Uh, this is a big insurance company. Um, this is their uh, process flow. Um, uh, they had a problem with their compute. They needed compute, order server, server goes into goods in, uh, modify mount racket. Uh, they had a bottleneck in the modifications of servers. So they wanted to get rid of the bottleneck, improve their process flow. They'd spent six months roughly working on this. Um, and they came up with this robotics plan uh, in, in buying you know, tens of millions in terms of robotics, to do these, fix these problems, improve the workflow. And then wonderful RI calculations, all that sort of stuff. It was gonna make its return and sub one year. I mean, they're quite large. And the problem is, if I'd gone in there and said, you know, why do you need robots? Again, I'm challenging their story. This six months, they're not fools. They've got all these wonderful business cases, blah, blah, blah. So, so instead I said, well, do you mind if we sort of map it? And they were like, well, oh, that sounds complicated. Oh, take 10 or 15 minutes. It took about 15, maybe 20 minutes anyway. So that's the map they did. And they went, user needs compute. Okay, they put computing product. I might disagree with this. It's a common language I can now challenge, but compute, order server, server goods in, rack, mount, modify. And I simply looked at the map and asked a question. Why have you got rack and custom built? And they went, oh, we have custom built racks. Ah, huh. what are the modifications you're doing to service? Well, the servers we buy don't fit our racks. So we have to take the cases off, drill new holes, add new plates in order to get them to fit our racks. Ah, and that's why you need robotics, yes. And at which point somebody in the group just went, why are we using standard racks? Yeah, why aren't you? Because then you wouldn't have to modify the service. Now this is probably the most common problem I see. People attempting to optimize process flow when they need to optimize first evolutionary flow, stop custom building what's a commodity. Uh, I, 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 I mean, forget tens of millions, I see billions wasted on this. Um, and this is incredibly common. And this isn't because people are daft, by the way, they're not. Uh, they're just trapped by context. They're trapped by the stories. There was a time that custom built racks made sense, but not now. And once you do that, you realize actually racks should be standard. Now we can have a more sensible conversation about compute. Really, is a product more utility? And if it's a utility, shouldn't that be the process flow we're optimizing? Should we be investing tens of millions in robots? No. So I'll give you another example um, because it's also useful for um, uh, basically uh, cross, uh, um, cross communication or communication across groups, I should say. Right, so this is to do with weighing scales. 
Now, this is a more of a government example. Uh, and they were having a digital transformation program. So if I went in there, went, you know, why are you doing digital transformation? It would be anger, 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 blah, challenge story. Can't do that. Um, so I got them to map it. And so uh, this particular agency reports a number, a count to another department. And they get the count from weighing machines. What they do is they weigh up paper forms because we fill in so many paper forms, it's cheaper to weigh them and then run through a calculation to work out how many paper forms there are, which they report in, in their count. So they have weighing machines, they have paper forms, and they have a system which they keep a tally on. And their digital transformation uh, program is all about spending many millions making the weighing machines communicate with the system a bit more effectively. So it's like, cool, okay, fine, I understand that. Um, where are your paper forms coming from? Ah, goods in, okay. You go down to goods in, where are you getting your paper forms from? Oh, we get them from distribution sites all over the country. Right. So you go along, talk to a distribution site. Where are you getting your paper forms from? Oh, we print them out. Ah, there's about 40 of you around the country. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're printing out these paper forms. We are. And sending them to this other group. Yeah. Do you know what they're doing with them? No. Ah, well, they're, they're, they're weighing them to see how many you've printed out. Where are you printing them out from? Well, our users fill our website and it's in our CRM system. So we print the forms out from our CRM system and then and then send them off. It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. It made sense at some point in the past, you know, when there wasn't electronic records. But again, it's trapped by context. Uh, all of this could be replaced by select count star from table. OK. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So does it make sense to go and invest a huge amount of money in building a, um, a, a you know, more fancy weighing machines connected. No, of course it doesn't. Right, so once you do that, then you start to learn patterns. So the first patterns you observe are, are climactic patterns. There's three basic types of patterns. There's climactic patterns, doctrine, and, and leadership gameplay patterns. So climactic patterns are rules that influence the game. Um, it, they change the environment. Not much you can do about them, but they're useful to know for anticipation. A doctrine are universally useful principles. So they're principles you could apply, um, but you probably should because they're universally useful. And, and then gameplay is all context specific stuff. So it works in certain places, manipulates the boards in certain way. All right, but they're still with climactic patterns, first of all. There's 30 of these, so we're not going through them all, just a few. So here I have a basic uh, map, user needs an application, best code built on best coding practice for use of a runtime. Runtime's a coding environment, um, built on an operating system, built on best architectural practice, built on compute. I've got a few compute ones. We'll get to some heavy engineering and a bit of nation state ones later. All right, so that's a basic, basic uh, map. The first pattern you learn is everything evolves, like compute started somewhere, genesis of it, and eventually became more, much more commodity. So again, you get the genesis, the first ever appearance, the Z3 1943, uh, custom built systems like Leo, Lions Electronic Office. Our products, rental services started off with IBM 650, uh, and then eventually, you know, we, we got further improvements of that, uh, and then eventually becomes more commodity-like. Um, so everything evolves. And, and recently we've seen this with compute going from a product to compute as a utility with cloud. Uh, we always have um, inertia uh, caused by past success. There's about 16 different forms of inertia. Uh, so we're very good at use of computers, a product, data building data centers or whatever, and our best architectural practices for computers, a product like disaster recovery tests. And then of course, as it evolves, its characteristics change. And um, unfortunately, all our inertia is, it doesn't like this thing. We, we, what, what about our data centers and all the money I've spent and everything else? Now, the classic example of this is Blockbuster and Netflix. So Blockbuster was first with a website, uh, first with video ordering online, first with experimenting with video streaming. It was also the first to go bankrupt. So Blockbuster out-innovated everybody, including Netflix. Uh, the problem is it had inertia created by a pre-existing business model, which was based upon late fees. So it needed the physical stores for you not to take your video back to, for those who remember those video cassettes and the annoyance of late fees. All right, 
So as things evolve, uh, another thing that happens is you get what's known as co-evolution of practice. So compute goes from product to utility, more cloud. We get a new set of practice. So we go from disaster recovery tests, N plus one to distributed systems and design for failure, what we ended up calling DevOps. And of course, those new practices and that efficiency uh, creates, uh, enables new needs and new things to be built, new services to be rapidly created. And that's just componentization affects Herman Simon's theory of hierarchy. Okay, so then what happens is um, those new higher order systems that we create, so like electricity enabling radio, television, computing, whatever, um, become new sources of value or worth as they evolve. So what you've got is efficiency, speed, and new sources of value, um, all created by the industrialization, the shift of something from product to utility. And this leads to what we call the Red Queen effect, uh, Professor Van Valen. If you're competing against others and somebody evolves and gets that benefit of speed, efficiency, new value, it creates pressure on you to adapt. As more evolve, the pressure on you mounts. Um, but it's okay if you work in an industry where nobody evolves, then, then you're okay. Um, but unfortunately, that also means that some new entrant can come in and chew up your industry. So from my point of view, this was really useful for investment. So when mapping out the environment, I could see, look, this is where I need to focus my money. It's going to be cloud, this is back in 2006, 2007, cloud, emerging practice, new needs. Um, or I may want to differentiate on the core service, but more importantly, it'll also tell me what not to invest in. I certainly didn't want to invest any more in data centers and computers as a product or anything along those lines. Now I used this uh, when I was at Ubuntu. So I used to run strategy for Ubuntu, 2008 to 2010. 2008, we're about 3% of the operating system market against uh, Windows and uh, Red Hat. Um, and we use this, the mapping technique to attack the cloud. It cost me half a million and 18 months, and we took 70% of all cloud computing. So if, if you were in cloud 2008 to 2010, you probably remember a time when it suddenly Ubuntu was absolutely everywhere. Well, you were mapped. Now, of course, the evolution continues. Uh, so the emerging practice evolves. Uh, we eventually give it a name, a flag, uh, DevOps. And, and the process is ongoing. So today the runtime has shifted to more of a utility with AWS Lambda. That was, uh, oh gosh, um, that was 2014. So God, that was six years ago. God, there we are. And, and you're seeing a new emerging practice all to do with things like capital flow, new industries being created. Uh, it's, it's no different to how it was in the past. Okay. So that's where you should be investing today. You know, if you're thinking about doing stuff, serverless, those new emerging practices, uh, all the rest of the stuff is now the new legacy or heading that way. Now, normally at this point, somebody goes, uh, uh, DevOps as the new legacy. Well, look, strategy is iterative. So by that, I mean what works in 2010. So DevOps, infrastructure as a service, absolutely spot on 2010. But 2020, if you were starting that today, uh, assume you're as fast as Netflix and they took seven years to get off their data centers. So, so we'll give, give you almost as fast as net, Netflix. It'll be 2030 uh, before you got rid of your data centers and you put your DevOps program, by which time everything's all shifted to serverless and everything else. So all you're doing is building the new legacy. Of course, you go to a conference and say DevOps is the new legacy. People go, burn him heretic. Here we are. All right. Um, but we're also seeing this in so many different areas. Um, it's the same thing. If we take events, for example, a user wants to go to event, used to be based upon a physical space. Um, there's always been pressure to create virtual events. The first one I did was in 2006. Um, and we'd known as it, if space goes much more virtual, we'll get a new set of practices appearing. And uh, we've always had inertia to this idea, um, mainly because of social interaction. So we said, oh, we can't do, oh, it's not the same being online, et cetera, et cetera. You can't, you can't uh, corridor conversation or whatever it happens to be. Of course, what we've happen has happened is COVID is basically the isolation economy, not social isolation, but physical. And that's created a forcing function for change. So it's a bit like uh, New York City, uh, turn of the 20th century, uh, early 1900s, 
I used to, they used to write reports about the city was almost buried in manure, uh, mountains of manure on the side of the roads because uh, of the horses. And that created the forcing function for change and adoption of the motor car. Same way, physical isolation is causing, causing the forcing function. It's not like companies are doing new stuff. It's, there, it's more they're catching up uh, with or being forced uh, to, to, to evolve something they probably should have done quite some time ago. Now, if you're a business, so we've had new user here, business, um, you might be thinking, oh gosh, you know, I used to be really happy with my physical events and all the rest of it. That's how I like to make money. Uh, maybe it's related also to power structures and things like that. You know, um, I like physical events because I have physical presence or whatever it happens to be. Um, a lot of management are suffering from loss of power within the more virtual world. Um, so you might be hoping it all goes back. Um, yeah. Uh, reality is people are already developing new ways of creating social interaction in the virtual space. Uh, there's new emerging practice. There's new needs. So it's, it's never going back. I mean, bits of it might do, uh, but we generally tend to evolve and move on. Okay. So now I'm going to get on to something called um, doctrine. So doctrine, again, it's another one of the patterns. So climactic about the landscape, how it's changing, you know, um, uh, rules of the game. Doctrine, well, these are all universally applicable principles, uh, regardless of context. And what do I mean by that? Um, these are principles which you could use or not use, but they turn out to be universally useful. So it's a good idea to use them. And for the example of this, I'm going to uh, focus on one. I'm going to use uh, HS2, high speed rail. So this is James Finley, uh, CIO HS2, was the CIO. Uh, this is his problem. He wanted to build HS2, high speed rail, big, massive engineering project in a virtual world. This is the systems diagram for it. It's not a map, it's a systems diagram. And his problem was, well, which bit should I outsource? Should I build in-house? What should I do with agile techniques? Now, th those three questions applied to that diagram gives you about 387 million possible permutations. So he's like, oh, what should I do? So normally what would happen is we just outsource a whole lot. And we'd outsource the whole lot. And uh, we wouldn't do it all in one. We'd break it into what we call lot structures, sensible lots, like lot for engineering. That's engineering these type things stuck together. Uh, lot for user experience. That's user experience stuff stuck together. Uh, back office, uh, finance. Well, I don't even know what those are things, but they sound back office-y. We'll stick that in a lot and some infrastructure. And that's how we'd normally go and do it. And we had all sorts of problems. So James decided he would sit down, this was 2012, uh, and Sunday afternoon quickly drew a map, he's an old friend of mine. And so that's the paper map, he sent it to me. Uh, I quickly modified it, put it into this format. And I said, well, James, this is a really easy problem now uh, because I've done this many, many times before. And I said, what you've got to understand is things on the left uh, in this uncharted space, as we like to call it, evolve and eventually become industrialized. Money, computing, penicillin, doesn't matter. Now, as they evolve, their characteristics change. Chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, changing, different, becoming ordered, known, measured, stable, standard, dull. Because of that, there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all methods. So agile extreme programming is in-house development very strong on the left-hand side because it reduces the cost of change and changes the norm. On the right hand side, Six Sigma and outsourcing is best because it reduces deviation. And that's what you want with something which is highly industrialized. And in the middle, you're all really about lean. You're all about learning and reducing waste. So all three methods are appropriate. You just got to know when to use them. Now we've got a map. It's quite simple. Um, oh, by the way, don't say that at a conference. If you go to an Agile conference or Six Sigma conference or a, a, a lean, and you say they, their, their method doesn't work everywhere, this is the response you get. Anyway, so now it was really simple. Took the map. We just went outsource the stuff on the right, off the shelf products in the middle, Agile in-house on the left. Bang, use appropriate methods. Uh, this ended up being in front of the public accounts committee, being delivered way ahead of schedule, way under budget and all the rest of it. I think it's the first part of HS2 which managed to do that. Um, but it was simple because we used appropriate methods. What would have happened if we'd done it the old way? Outsourced the whole lot in that lot structure. Well, there's the map. We've outsourced the whole lot. 
Okay, let's take one of those lots, apply it to the map. There you are, lot one engineering. Okay, now what I've got is I'm mixing custom built stuff with commodity stuff. That's a problem because we're gonna try and specify what we want. And we can specify the stuff on the right where so some of the project will be efficiently treated, but we can't specify the stuff on the left because we're still learning about it. So we're always going to incur excessive change control costs. It's great fun. You can sit down there with massive great big projects, just quickly map it out. You know, you spend a few hours, overlay the contract structure, and you can literally go, right, that project's going to be a cost overrun, contract will fail, that, that contract's going to be a massive cost overrun before they've even started work. Uh, I mean, you're geared, you're set up to fail. Um, so this actually leads to another piece of doctrine, uh, which is about focusing on the outcome. So not just using appropriate methods, but also focusing on the outcome. All right. Uh, in a worst case scenario, and this is a worst case scenario, if you don't have maps or anything along those lines, you'll outsource the whole lot. Um, you'll, you'll get hit by excessive change control cost. Um, the vendor will get to blame you because they say you didn't know what you really wanted. Well, you couldn't know what you wanted in that custom built area. So it's pretty much a scam. And then the worst thing is somebody on your side says, next time we need to specify it better. I mean, you're just doomed to failure from then on. Um, or go agile. The other one is people like to yo-yo. They go, oh, we should use Six Sigma everywhere or lean or agile everywhere. Oh God, it's all not a good idea. Okay. So I'll give you another one, emergency services, mobile communication platform, critical infrastructure. Again, wonderful specification document, fabulous stuff, no map. So you ask, what's the user need? People goes mm, like that. So very quickly, they start off, uh, it's an afternoon, user, what do they need? Point to point, job dispatch, video, et cetera. And underneath this is a whole bunch of other components. So we've now got a map and we won't go through the details. You can all have these slides, uh, but it's, it's pretty simple. You now group things together based upon, you know, similar stages of evolution. And so we're agile in-house development on the left-hand side, off-the-shelf products in the middle, outsource on the right. Pretty straightforward. Now, in this case, uh, they decide not to do this. Uh, they decide to go with their uh, pre-existing lot structure, um, which was not a good idea. It's ended up costing a lot of money, etc. But not all is lost because what happens is you can share the maps. So you share borders, immigration, police, you share the maps and you start to discover we have duplication and bias in our maps. So we build the same thing several times or whatever, um, you know, user registration, who hasn't built one 10 times, every developer. I mean, so um, use this to remove bias and duplication. And um, before anybody thinks that this is having a pop-up government, um, the worst, I've ever found in government is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing. That is peanuts compared to the private sector. I've got a pharma company who's got 350 teams building enterprise content management systems, five global efforts building the global enterprise content management system, none of which know the others exist. Uh, I've got a bank who've managed to build risk management a thousand times. I mean, well, more than. We stopped counting at that point. So, you know, uh, government is nowhere near as bad as a lot of what you see in the private sector. In fact, government is a bastion of efficiency compared to what we see, what I see in the private sector. All right. So now, um, can we, we will get on to just do it. How do, how do you, how do you do it? So how do you go about mapping? Um, so my mapping has been used, well, I used it for creating something called the Better for Less paper, which led to things called spend control and helped in something called GDS in the UK. Um, we did quite a bit of mapping in UK government. Um, this is one particular project, Liam Maxwell, uh, 425 million, saved by simply mapping it out. I had another one where they reckon the economic impact's about 12 billion. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, the, the ones that excite me most are things like this. This is uh, RNLI, lifeboats, where they use mapping to reduce call-out times. Uh, that saved hundreds of lives. Um, apparently, it's gonna, they reckon it might save a thousand a year, which is like, that's fantastic. I love the use of mapping for, you know, um, uh, reducing things like illegal fishing and uh, uh, trafficking humans, that sort of stuff is, is fantastic. Uh, it's a UN global platform uh, and that's all built um, uh, entire information technology strategies or maps in there. Um, GCHQ. Uh, so this is where we get into organizational structure, which we won't do today. Uh, but this, this document's all open. You can go and find it, read it, 
GCHQ is our intelligence services, search boiling frogs, you'll, you'll, and we'll talk about three party structure. There's something called Pioneer Settler Town Planner, which you need to use maps for. Uh, it's used in Bench Catalyst. Uh, this is Upeka in India, who basically use mapping. They've got about, well, they're more than 48 startups now doing all very well uh, using mapping. Uh, it's even used to write books. So um, this is Reaching Cloud Velocity. I, I like this book. This is uh, Amazon's second ever, AWS's second ever book. And you'll find on page 57, Mapping Your Way Through a Journey. It's about 13, 14 pages of mapping, including something called the ILC model, which uh, is, is a model I created back in 2005, which is basically how Amazon tears, tears up industries. Um, You'll also find uh, this book called The Punch of Scrow, science fiction book written by uh, 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 Tao Klein, who built a successful company with mapping. He's now a science fiction author. It's a very good book, uh, all built with mapping, but there we are. So how do you get started? One, know your users. Go back to the tea shop. The first thing you need to do is understand who your users are. So if you're mapping out you know, uh, course tribunal services, don't forget, you know, you've got prisoners in there it's not just the judiciary and the public and the government you've also got you know, prisoners happen to be a user so know your users number two focus on user needs obvious number three know the details understand the components that's why you build a value chain okay understand what is being considered it's not enough just to know the components connected you've got to think about how evolved the components are have a common language. Well, once you've got this, we can now all discuss the environment and how it might change. Challenge assumptions. Okay, you can do this with maps because I'm telling you the map is wrong. I'm not telling you that you're wrong or your story is wrong. I'm saying I disagree with the map. So it's great for challenging assumptions. Remove bias and duplication. So once you've decided the kettle shouldn't be custom built more of a product, you might discover power and water. We've got that elsewhere in the building. We don't have to build our own or whatever it happens to be. Great, remove bias and duplication. Use appropriate methods, okay? We'll agile this off the shelf here. We'll use, you know, more industrialized process commodities over here. And the best way of doing this is through something called spend control. So Spain Control is a lousy name, I know, because I, 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 I'm lousy at naming things, and it's my fault it was called Spain Control. It's basically a system of pre-mortem and post-mortem challenge. So ideally, uh, when somebody wants to do something, you say, yeah, let's, let's map it out. Get them to map it out, and somebody can give them a better challenge, you know, why are we custom building kettles or whatever, and, uh, and then you can record it. They, they can ignore you, uh, that's fine, uh, but they go and build, but afterwards we do a post-mortem challenge. So that's the point sitting down with, oh, here's the map beforehand, what actually happened, okay? Um, and a bias towards, that gives you a bias towards data, the maps are that data. Anyway, these are all connected. Uh, so you can actually map these doctrines. So use appropriate methods, needs you to challenge assumption, needs to have a bias towards data. You've got to work out which methods work where, Agile here, Six Sigma here. That requires you to have a common language and talk about what is being considered. Uh, you've got to know the details, which means you've got to focus on user needs, which means you've got to know your users. So if you don't do the one at the bottom, you can't do the ones at the top, okay? So if you don't know your users, you're never going to be able to work out what's the appropriate method. I mean, you're blind. Anyway, um, I've shown you a handful of doctrine. Uh, I'm going to horrify you now. There are approximately 40 universally useful principles, and I don't want you to start reading them. It's all online. It's all Creative Commons, has been for 15 years. Help yourself. Um, it's um, uh, there's about 40 of them, and I've just highlighted the phase one ones because I put these based upon those sorts of maps, just ordered them. Phase one, you know, common language, challenge assumptions, understand what is being considered, know your users, focus on user needs. This is what you want to do. That's the basics, okay? And something like spend control, because that you know, gives you that process of challenge and, and that data will help you do these phase ones. Those are the basics. Now, this is a web engineering giant. Just look at the color blue. Uh, blue means good here. Uh, they're pretty much good at most of this stuff. This is a bank. And they're red everywhere. They're rubbish at it. Okay, but how does the bank survive? Because it goes back to that red queen. You know, it's okay if you're rubbish at this, as long as everybody else you're competing in against is rubbish at this. If you're all useless, then no one gains an advantage. The problem, the only danger the banks have is something like, you know, one of those players who are good at this stuff comes into their space, then they're in trouble. 
I suppose the other lesson, uh, people often say, oh, we should learn in government from the private sector. The private sector knows, knows best, just burn them. I mean, it's just, if you look at the state of some of the private sector, um, no. Right, so sovereignty. Uh, da, 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 da. So, Rob, how long have we got, roughly? We have about uh, 30 minutes, but there's a couple of questions that were inside the... Um... And comments that were in the, in well, the chat. Oh, you've got a choice. I can either tell you all about digital sovereignty, take you through culture and the total nightmare and how people are getting that all wrong. Um, or we can answer some questions. I don't mind. Which, whichever way you want to go. Sovereign That's... and culture. Tell us about sovereignty. Oh, okay. This is all right. I'll, I'll warn you if I go down the sovereignty, you better answer in the chat. It gets a little bit complex. If your heads are already fried, Finish it. All right. Okay. Oh, I've been ordered, sir. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll, we'll get there. All right. So, da -da -da. so normally, when we talk about physical sovereignty, we talk about you know our landscape, usually in respect of some sort of map. This is a place where our collectives, our behaviours, our values exist. Here are our borders. Really easy to understand. Well. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the, I've got to link this all to these maps. So I'm going to start with HS2. So building HS2 in a virtual world. There was the map using multiple different methods. That was 2012. Now, what you've got here is the principle. Uh, I doctrine is just a collection of principles. And one of them was use appropriate methods, which is what we've got here. But what you might not have noticed is we also have two beliefs. One is a belief in people over process, which is very much the agile world. And one is a belief in process over people, which is very much on the right hand industrialized space. The process matters the most. Now, these, although they're opposite, are not mutually exclusive. They can exist at the same time in the same landscape because they're context specific. I, they can both be true at the same time, depending upon the context. So some beliefs are like exclusive. You believe in God, you don't believe in God or whatever it happens to be. Some are not mutually exclusive. Right. So this brings us into culture. So Kroeber, despite a century of effort to define culture adequately, there is no agreement among anthropologists regarding its nature. They're the experts. I hear all these people say, oh, this is culture. Really? Anthropologists have been doing this for over a century. They can't agree. Okay. Why not? Well, one of my favourite anthropologists is Margaret Mead. And Margaret Mead talked about how language Oh, we seem to have lost Simon for a second. I think he'll be back in just a moment. We were talking about this at the very beginning that he has uh, as a little tiny bit of uh, an internet connection requirement. So while he comes back Oh, here we go, Simon. You're muted. I know, I'm back. I'm there my you apologies go. for that. Okay. You just gave me a heart attack. I, I, I would never be able to talk about anything here. <laughs> no, no, don't worry, don't worry. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can, can you tell me where I got up to before, obviously, my all my internet connection died on me? Actually, it was the power again. That's really annoying. We just had another power cut. But it's okay, I've got batteries. Um, so, so, Rob, where did I get up to? Hello, Rob. Sorry, I'm here. I'm having a little problem. I just dropped something on the floor. Oh, no, no, no. Did I get up to Kroba, by the way? You just started Kroba. Kroba, right. Okay. I'm so sorry. No, no, not a problem. To... Look, we're all online. These things happen. I, I live in the UK. We got terrible infrastructure. Anyway, um, so uh, what I will do is I'll start here. So we have two beliefs. Uh, people over process and process over people. And this leads us into that, that conversation about culture. Okay. Now, um, the problem is, is despite a century of effort to define culture adequately, there is no agreement amongst anthropologists regarding its nature. This is the work of Kroeber. So no one can adequately define culture. I know people come in and say, this is what culture is. There, there is no agreement. And part of the problem um, is this, uh, what Margaret Mead, Margaret Mead is one of my favorite anthropologist, talked about language is a discipline of cultural behavior. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, 
Uh, what it means is if language is part of culture, you're not going to be able to use language to describe culture. And that's a problem known as Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So if you want to describe culture, you're going to have to go outside of language. Okay, that's quite an interesting concept. Now, Rob, are you still there, by the way? Or somebody, if somebody can just jump in. Oh, I'm good, definitely here. Good, right. So do you, so do you remember with doctrine? I went, use appropriate methods, bias towards data, challenge assumptions, and draw a map of the interconnections of doctrine. Well, if you look at the axes at the bottom, Genesis, custom-built product commodity, does that really make sense for doctrine, you know, principles? Well, I'm cheating a little bit. And the reason why I'm cheating is this. Um, when I originally did the work back in 2005, looking at how capital evolved, I really should have called it stage one, two, three, and four. But what I did was I used 9,223 text documents, not that that number is burnt in my mind forevermore, and did a whole bunch of text analysis and came up with a bunch of characteristics and a bunch of practices novel emerging good and best so we could use that for principles or data model divergent convergent model they're all labels for stage one two three and four why does this matter well i can mix and match i can take any label from stage one mix it with any label in stage two stage three and stage four so why is that interesting well i can start mapping ethical values with those labels concept emerging convergent accepted so i can start thinking about a collective i start going universal basic income paid holiday unionization what does that require anti-discrimination laws both of those uh, workers rights civil rights as martin luther uh, king said the twin pillars of democracy workers rights is based upon the rights of labor so that's abolition of slavery as well and underneath that reciprocity and fairness so i can start to map out the values of a society now, normally what I do is I take that whole lot and the most visible ones and I put them in a box, which looks like this. Uh, I just say, look, uh, we're going to have values and we've got basically a pipeline, new values appearing and some that have evolved and become much more uh, accepted. And that's connected to the collective. And then I keep on going through this exercise saying, well, what else is what it's connected? And what you end up with is something like this. So, you know, you've got collective connected to behavior, connected to values, connected to memory, rituals and symbols. Um, uh, collective, you know, you want to succeed. It's, that requires competition and that impacts the sort of gameplay that you can do as well. You've got concepts of safety, belonging, agency. So these are all interconnected components. Now, this is a very imperfect map of culture. So if you want to define culture, just to define the paths and components I'm showing you there, uh, that would be about three pages of words. And of course, that's missing all the things that aren't on there and the fact that all of this stuff is evolving over space. So you're not even going to be able to define a single bit within 25 words. So you're, you're talking huge amounts of uh, um, documentation just to define a simple map like this. So why is it relevant? Okay, well, first of all, it's not singular. We belong to many collectors, uh, nation state, football club, church, whatever it happens to be. Secondly, you can't just copy the values of one culture and expect your culture to be the same. So you can't go, what are Spotify's values? Let's adopt those. We'll be like Spotify because there's so many other components involved. Two, you can adopt doctrine and principles from one to another, but you've got to be mindful that you've got to implement them in your landscape. So they will be different. Thirdly, uh, you start to discover there are feedback loops. So any collective, you know, wants to be successful in terms of spreading its values, okay? And that depends upon our behavior. And of course that success and our people following that behavior increases our feeling of safety, which increases our feeling of belonging to the collective. And so it's a wonderful cycle, reinforcing, you know, rah, rah, uh, democracy is all great in terms of our form of democracy, whilst the economy is, uh, is better than everybody else's. Uh, but equally, that can suddenly become negative as well. Uh, once the, you, you know, you start losing that concept of success, you are based upon your values, you know, we're, we're, we're this type of democracy and we're not winning at everything. Suddenly, you know, our feeling of safety, sense of belonging, all of that sort of stuff declines. If people aren't showing the right behaviours as well, it becomes a negative loop.
And you can see that in lots of different places. I mean, the UK, we've got this whole uh, collapse of people's trust, a lot of it was kick kicked off by certain individuals' actions, uh, which were um, not conducive to building, well, not conducive to our core values. Okay. So we come back to the subject of sovereignty again, because we've got collective behavior, values, and landscape represented. But, but how do we make this tangible? I mean, uh, and this sounds very complex. Uh, how, how, why does it matter in the digital world? How do we link this all together? Well, to do that, I'm going to show you a car. So uh, this is something we did in the DBLA, oh gosh, six years ago, something like that. We looked at the automotive industry and rolled it forward. Um, so uh, basically many of the components, including self-driving cars, will increasingly become commodity-like. And that's of interest from a nation state competition point of view, because actually, if you overlay China's play, oops, went back a slide. Um, uh, you look at their 2025 plans. China is very good uh, at doing basically strategic investment designed to industrialize components and then moving up the uh, uh, other value chain on the right hand side. Very similar to Amazon. Amazon just industrializes and move, moves up the stack. It's a very powerful play. Anyway. From the point of view of an automotive industry, I mean, a lot of the stuff will become less important. So we suspected a lot would look at how to recreate status uh, in this world. So how do you recreate status in a world where many of the things are becoming commodity-like? Well, um, we suspected somebody would come up with a digital subscription model, um, probably linked to things like um, route management and design of the vehicle. And sure enough, about four or five years later, BMW started talking digital subscription models. Now, what do we mean by that? Uh, we mean you won't own your self-driving car, um, but when you get in it, you might be gold, platinum, silver member, whatever, or bronze member. If you're a gold member, wonderful experience. If you're a bronze member, you know, it's going to be water wall advertising. Okay, doesn't sound too bad. Uh, this is where the problem occurs. Um, now, a bunch of bronze members going along the road, gold member comes along. Of course, if we've uh, self-driving cars, uh, all the cars will move out of the way. So gold members can get to their destination quick. People might think that's a really good idea, except for when we have a flood, that also means all the poor people don't get out, all the wealthy people do. And next day we've got pitchforks. So it's not generally a good idea to bed social inequality to transportation systems, or if you're going to at least have a plan for what to do when something goes wrong. So, um, a problem is this, is that um, when you look at intelligent agents in that map, and I've highlighted it in red, uh, we train them within simulation models. So as well as embedding social inequality, we have simulation models where we embed our values. Uh, and by that, I mean the values of our collective. And by that, I mean the trolley problem. So driving cars coming along, you can kill five people or one person. Okay, in some societies, if the five people are all, I don't know, um, poor, and the one person is a super rich, wealthy person, uh, then bye-bye the five people. Uh, in other countries, the value of human life is more <laughs> worth more than how much money you have. So it, it, it's uh, tough luck, the super wealthy investment banker or whatever. Um, so very much uh, the values that we have in society will be embedded in the training and simulation models, which will be used to train the AI. And you see this already, uh, Beijing IE principles, uh, be diverse, be inclusive, real focus. Um, uh, China, it's 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party next year in July. Uh, they're gearing up to say, you know, we reduce poverty 850 million odd. The next century is all about reducing inequality, um, uh, which of course is something we can't, uh, market system just can't really cope with that um and um you know they're already embedding it in their principles uh real focus uh, and they're great principles so it's just our systems we're not geared up okay so that's what we mean by digital sovereignty it's a bit like physical sovereignty you understand your landscape and then you better work out you know where you want to put your borders in this digital landscape where you want to protect you know your collective your behaviors and your values this is the bit that we want to own Okay. No different from physical sovereignty. But we're not doing that. We're mostly, mostly, you know, whenever I hear people talking about digital sovereignty, it's all about stories. There's never a map to be seen. It's like people talking physical sovereignty without maps, just giving good stories. 
Um, lots of SWOT diagrams, really not interested. Um, lots of, oh, well, look, we'll just copy a, a look, look what they're doing over there. We'll have one of those 67% uh, of general problems. I mean, this sums it up for me. Uh, the EU recently, we're going to build, spend 11.8 billion over the next uh, seven years to help build our homegrown cloud computing sector. You know, we're going to build our own cloud. Um, yeah, it makes sense. 2010, 2009, 2008, maybe, but we're not there. It's 2020. We've moved on a long way. So um, for me, this is probably going to be one of the most expensive homemade toasters uh, ever made. There we are. Not a great idea. So summary i started off with the issue of strategy uh, mine was lousy uh, i had none just copying others uh talked about the importance of situational awareness why it matters uh, why you need maps for this uh, we can't really do it with stories and magic frameworks why we are mostly trapped by context the, people aren't daft uh, they're, they're just trapped by stories uh then we talked you know some very basic patterns i mean there's 30 economic patterns so i think i talked maybe five or six um, then we got into doctrine. There's 40 of those. I think we mentioned phase one, so there's about six or seven of those. Uh, just about how to go about doing this mapping stuff, really critically important. Trying to try and policy your way to the future. You've got to have a, a mechanism of challenge, something like spend control is a generally I found a really good idea. And then we, we talked about the whole issue of sovereignty. I, I haven't talked about organizational structure or gameplay. It's about 110 different methods of manipulating. I mean, it's a it's this is quite a big field, but hopefully that'll give you some basic introduction. Um, it's a cycle. So the more you get good at this, the more you map, the more patterns you learn, etc. It's fairly quick, you know, take a couple of hours to, to map something of any significant, well, most things of significant scale. The more you do it, the better you get. Simple as that. Um, the other thing to remember is all maps are imperfect representations. So a map of France is an imperfect representation of France. To be a perfect representation, it would have to be one-to-one -one scale, which means it would be the size of France, and therefore as a map that would be useless because it would be France. So maps are all imperfect representations and they're all models, which means they're also wrong. So if you can cope with the fact that they are imperfect and they're wrong, uh, it turns out the maps are actually quite useful. Uh, so that's one of the big things, mistakes people make. Don't try and create the perfect map, you can't. I suppose, lastly, tips, because uh, people sometimes ask me for tips on this sort of stuff. Um, so from my 15 years of mapping and all the stuff that I've done, here are my tips. Uh, ignore strategy, culture, structure, vision, sovereignty. Don't do any of those sorts of stuff. Um, just ignore it. Uh, focus on awareness and doctrine. If you get yourself aware of the space that you're operating in and you start to understand basic principles of operating in that space, then the stuff that you're ignoring will come come more naturally to you. Uh, but if you're starting off and you've got to go, oh, we better have a strategy, we better get the right culture, structure, and all, just ignore it. Leave it. Leave it. Focus on the stuff, our awareness and doctrine uh, to begin with. Now, all of this stuff, by the way, is Creative Commons. Uh, made it Creative Commons a long time ago. Uh, Medium.com, Wardley Maps, there's about 600 pages of book there. It's quite a heavy reading. I promise at some point I will finish it. List.wardleymaps.com, entire community. You'll find training videos, people doing all sorts of things, map camps, local map groups. It's all free. Help yourself. It's all Creative Commons. At that point, I will finally get quiet. <laughs> I could listen to you all day long. I, I was really enjoying this, but we do have a couple of questions there um, sure. that were put in. And I think Jillian had mentioned, uh, do you recommend, uh, can you recommend the best way forward from this session on books, training and courses? Uh -huh. um, so, so generally it takes about seven years uh, for people to get good at mapping. Okay. Uh, and, and that seven years is broken into the following. Uh, six years, 11 months and 10, 10 days going, I need to do some mapping and 20 days of actually doing it. Um, so, so the hardest thing of mapping is to start because everybody wants to try and create the perfect map and everything else. Um, you don't have to. You start with thinking, well, you've got to start from the point of view, do I know who my users are? Let's write those down. Do I know what their needs are? Um, that's a big, big jump. Okay, we'll put those down. Do I know what components and capabilities I need to have to make those needs happen? Great. Can I make that into a chain? Can. Now I simply need to go, right, I, I'll put that evolution access at the bottom, uh, you know, Genesis custom product commodity and just put things on the map. 
and then I'll show it to somebody else. And I will allow them to challenge me, tell me where I'm wrong, uh, tell me what needs I'm missing, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and that's it. That the first and most critical thing is just simply the start. Everybody wants to run and play games and, you know, manipulate things and blah. Don't. We'll start with the most basic. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, is uh, Tim still there? Tim Alardis? I think you had a question from earlier. You were uh, talking about the outside of the map or in the column it seems to be in. Do you want to do you want to bring that up, Tim? I don't know if he's still there. Okay, we don't have Tim there, but uh, Annette Hester had a statement. She made a statement, or I wonder if it was a statement or a question. It's like, can you all imagine moving this so fast in government? What are your thoughts on that? So I, I look at something like um, when I did the Better for Less paper with Liam and others, uh, and we had Francis Maud in the cabinet office and, uh, and Mike Brack and so forth, who, who uh, uh, created GDS, and Tom Lewis Maud, some really amazing people. Um, UK government was a, considered by many to be somewhat of a, 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 um, a, a, not the greatest place for IT. Uh, and that transformed very, very quickly by creating centers of gravity, attracting the right people. So you can move government. I mean, civil servants can move quickly. It's surprising. You're seeing it with COVID. So um, a lot of it, unfortunately, um, I, I think we spend far too much time uh, with big, expensive management consultants, normally <laughs> try, turning organizations. They've got all the capabilities. They've got the people. They 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 just need to um, uh, be able to um, um, understand the context, the environment that they're operating in. So I think government can move quickly. I, I, I don't buy this, this sort of idea that government um, can't. And I, I, I think the example is actually COVID um, just spells that out. Um, government is capable of, of moving quickly. Sorry, I just have to unmute myself there. Sorry about That's that. That's all right. Uh, cool. Um, Thomas K actually also mentioned um, uh, how to comply, uh, how to copy quality cloud maps into each nation's landscape and keep it uh, from updating and sharing it. Thomas, maybe you want to jump on for a second and expand on that. Are you here, Thomas? I've made people run away. <laughs> Apologies. No, I, I think I've lost Thomas as well. It's all good. But uh, Tim actually sent me a little note here. Um, Tim Tim was, uh, so he was asking about the user outside of the map or in the column it seems to be in. And he says it seems to be outside the columns and in the dots and lines inside the columns. So I think he's referring to something that you previously showed earlier. Okay, well, my apologies. My, my connection just suddenly cut out for a second or maybe it was yours. I don't know. I am back. Can you hear me okay? Can definitely hear you. Oh. oh, I've lost you again. Oh, we've lost Simon. Oh, no, uh, there you are. I, I, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's back. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, can you can you give me the question again, quickly? So Simon was saying, um, is the user outside the map or in the column it seems to be in? So he, he kind of oh. says, it seems to be outside the columns and the dots and the lines inside the columns. Okay, so to begin with... Um, uh, um, people often put the users all over the place. But as you get used to it, this, you realize those users are just a component in further value chains. Uh, and therefore, um, you should treat them in the same way. So there's something called the cheat sheet, which has the list of characteristics for each of those different stages. And so what you do is you just say, right, these users, as it widespread, are they widespread, well defined, well understood? Oh, disappeared for the last five seconds of your comment there. Oh. I'm going to see if I can try something. It might fix the problem. Hang on. Well, you're, you're there right now, so I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, you can you can continue. Okay, so, so the... Ah... Uh, no, I, I think we're losing you. Oh. 
Well, the good thing is, is that for the bulk of your presentation, we were able to have you, which is fantastic. And I'm sure that everyone's excited about that. You are back. So go for it right now if you want to. Super, super, super quickly. All right. So you have time. Uh, you have time. You have seven okay. minutes. Okay, fine. So um, there is something called the cheat sheet, which you use to help you work out which stage things are in. Do the same with users. Um, uh, use the same cheat sheet. So if they're widespread, well-defined, well-understood, put them in the more commodity. If, it, if they're a rare, poorly understood group, put them more in the, the custom built. So apply that to users as well. Amazing. Am I still here? You're definitely, you're definitely still there. Is there anyone else that has a question for Simon before we end our session? I think Dave, oh, <laughs> before, David popped before, on. <laughs> yeah, the marsh ends me. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, David. Hey, good day. Um, you, Hello, remember, sir. you remember Conway's law? Mel Conway, he's a good friend. So, <laughs> it, just for, I'll try to paraphrase it in, in a naive way. Um, organizations build software and systems that mimic Nick. mimic the internal structure that they've already built internally for their own processes. So I'm wondering if you can comment about making Conway's law, making doing something smarter or sharper or better that'll help organizations evolve too. Uh, I come, well, uh, so uh, Mel Conway, um, he's on Twitter. We talk uh, a lot about maps and culture and things like that. So um, um, uh, he's much smarter than me. So <laughs> I want to throw the question to him. Um, so um, there are particular organizational uh, structural forms that come out of mapping. Uh, as a, If you go through all the doctrine, and I said there's about 40, um, by the time you get to the end of it, what you tend to find is you're a more of a cell-based structure, which has multiple attitudes, something which we call pioneer settler town planner, and uses systems designed to replicate constant evolution. That's why I made the pointer to the GCHQ paper on boiling frogs, because a lot of that's within there as well. So um, I actually take the view that uh, your organizational structure that you need will emerge out of the principles that you, 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 you operate. Uh, the problem is, is most organizations um, are so poor at the basic principles. Uh, and then keep on slapping on fairly arbitrary structures like silos or even worse, uh, sort of matrix models, whereby we'll, we'll keep, create a product team and randomly throw people into it. Uh, and these people often have different attitudes. So so the, these teams are real hit and miss. Um, to explain this all, I need to take you through a, probably in a, about another 20 minutes <laughs> of... of um, uh, um, you, if you search for something called Pioneer Settler Town Planner, hopefully my my um, garbled nonsense there will make more sense. It looks like uh, Tim Alardis is uh, looking forward to your talk next week uh, or uh, in the future. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if we had extra time, I'm sure we would all be, uh, love to be here. We do have uh, time for another question. Uh, I think... Uh, Veronique asked, what is the number one mistake that people make when they build and use uh, or use a Wardley map? Okay, the number one mistake is, um, <laughs> is uh, well, A, uh, they, they, they don't start because they find it too frightening and too complex. And, and, and when they do start, they try to make the perfect map. Understand all maps are imperfect. Uh, they're also models, so they're all wrong. So, so critical, um, you know, is, is, is not, is not to worry about that stuff. You just make a good enough map because the real value comes from sharing with others, that communication, that process of challenge uh, and that process of learning. So, um, I suppose the biggest mistake people make is trying to make a perfect map. It's not only not possible, it's actually not useful. Amazing. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Is there any other last questions before we go? 
Yeah, I mean, these are Babylonian clay tablets. <laughs> um, I, I'm, yeah, my question to the audience, these are literally Babylonian clay tablets. They are that primitive. Uh, and I've already said they're imperfect and wrong. Would somebody please make a better map? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that is my, my question to everybody. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm looking forward to the day that somebody moves these maps on to slightly better maps. But there we are. I think Tim is asking one last question before we go. He's asking, how would you make a map and an evolving IT Agora for every city's community? Um, how would I make a map of every city's community? Well, I, I would imagine... Um, First of all, you'd start with one city. And in fact, actually, that, that's really um, uh, Jackie Taylor, Flying Binary. He was the uh, digital czar uh, or smart cities uh, czar for UK government. He's a huge mapper and used a lot of the mapping work uh, or mapping work in um, uh, designing smart cities and with multiple um, uh, different governments. So she probably already has it actually. Uh, so you should get Jackie Taylor. She's a wonderful speaker as well. Much more knowledgeable on, on city level uh, mapping than I am. Um, so um, A, I'd, I'd ask Jackie, how would I go about it? I would ask Jackie. Uh, but if I couldn't ask Jackie, I would probably start with one city and share from that one city to others. So break it down into small components of in terms of the IT systems, map it out, share with other cities uh, and uh, use that as a mechanism of communication. And the way to make that actually happen is I'll go back to spend control. If somebody in government simply says, look, if you're gonna spend huge amounts of money on something, you can at least spend an hour mapping it and have somebody else challenge you and what you're doing. And you use that as an iterative process to build up an understanding of your entire landscape. So there you are. I'd ask, number one, ask Jackie Taylor, uh, Flying Binary, uh, do you have any maps of cities because of all the smart city work she's done? And she is fabulous. And um, if that didn't work, uh, um, definitely introduce spin control. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Lots to digest here today. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to continue this conversation, I invite you to join uh, Ford 50 on Twitter or by following Simon at uh, S-W-A-R-D-L-E-Y on Twitter and by using the hashtag uh, Ford 50 uh, or even connect on the match uh, making platform. But uh, just before I say thank you, don't go away. The topic rooms are open from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. A uh, small plug, I'm heading over to the One Team Gov virtual team, bringing social innovation to community connection room. Topic with Fujitsu, AI considerations of the public sector. There's a tech, tech and talk with Jamie Joyce, with Yin Yin Liu, and becoming a C4C fellowship partner. So, Simon... On behalf of Forward 50, and of course, all of you are in the room today, thank you for joining us today for this introduction on worldly mapping. Folks, that concludes our session for today. Have a good evening, afternoon, or good morning. Hope to see you in the topic rooms. Simon, cheers. Pleasure.